Okay, so this is going to be a shout out and a, a somewhat of a response to does this have does this question have meaning? It was a video posted by the Laughing Out, and uh, I, I don't it's I don't really want to respond directly to the video. It's a great video. Check it out. I think there are things in there that I really agree with. There there are things that I want to respond to by sort of changing the context or moving the discussion. I think in a little bit of a different direction, and it's about from where comes meaning or what is the source of meaning and I want to somewhat argue against the notion that it's sentences per se which are the source of meaning that is if sentences were the source of meaning we'd never be able to judge how a sentence does or doesn't make sense and what I would want to suggest there is that we we need to very carefully differentiate between discourse which is social historical, it has to do with background practices of intelligibility, it has to do with recognition of different genres of both uh, forms of, of utterance, so the difference between a sentence and a phrase, things like that, the difference between a word and an utterance, all this, um, but it also has to do with uh, genres like an argument versus evidence within an argument or an illustration or a claim. I mean, just the, the sort of the meta terms that we use to understand the different forms within language, right? There's this whole discursive backdrop. Then there, there are all the different forms of language and language is meaning, uh, the syntactical meaning, uh, semantic meaning, and I guess even some of the elocutionary force of, of the speaker but there we start to get into to speech itself, right? Speech as an embodied, organismal, um, I guess it's like a gesticulation. I mean, the, the organism breathes life into the language, which has a kind of meaning according to the discursive backdrop. And it's th that tripart relationship, right? So when Chomsky, for example, when he gives his somewhat famous line of, colorless green ideas sleep furiously i think that's the that's the expression right and the the point would be that that sentence can be offered up within an argument as an illustration of nonsense or as an illustration of something that's meaningless only because we already have the meaningfulness of the entire context that's created not simply by more language but by discourse itself that is, there is a, or I guess by the intersection of discourse, speech, and language. But it's not just in the language. There's meaningfulness seems to be part and parcel of the human condition rather than something like it's an aggregate of ongoing linguistic meaning. That is, you're, you're not going to get at the, the question of meaningfulness or meaninglessness independent of the way speech and discourse intersect with the language. See, I think this is partly why humans live in this capacity to ask questions. And questions are meaningful even if the question doesn't make sense. So I can say a question like, does it make sense to say colorless green ideas sleep furiously? And when I say, does it make sense to ask, now I just made sense of what ultimately I can ask is that, and I say, no, it doesn't make any sense. But if I say it doesn't make any sense, that was me making sense of the fact that it doesn't make any sense. So there's like this meta level of knowing what nonsense is. Now, how do I know what nonsense is? How can I recognize it? You know, I can just say, does blank make sense? And you put, you whatever you fill in the blank, it could be utterly nonsense but in phrasing the form of the genre, right, this discursive form of, of a question, it turns it at least into the meaningful illustration of nonsense, if found to be just that, right? Okay, so again, there's so many different dynamics to get at here. And let me see if I can, I want to post a video below to a, a earlier video I did on the difference between discourse and speech and language. Um, you know, one way to think about speech is just to think of all the different ways you can intonate the word tonight, right? I, I think it was Stravinsky, right, who said, you know, that actors should be able to do it uh, 28, 30 different ways. You know, there's such a difference we, between saying something like tonight and tonight or tonight. I mean, there's all these different ways where you can say tonight. 
And um, th those senses of, of speech, right, they convey a certain kind of meaning that's, you know, independent of the language in such a way that you can sort of mock something. Like if somebody says nonsense to you, you could go, oh yeah, I agree. Well, you know, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And if you say it with a sarcastic tone, you say that what you're, you're, you, you give an utterance which by way of its speech and the tone acknowledges that what the other person said was nonsense and they can know that. Now, part of the problem here the larger problem is that there's evolving forms of discourse and those are partly created with new communication technologies. And so there's a, I don't want to say a radical difference, but there's an important significant difference between the holy oral word and then the word as it grows literate and the kinds of analysis that literacy makes possible, problems of spelling and problems of what a sentence is, you know, and that, that there's very dogmatic notions about what a sentence is. I'll see if I can post a TED talk to that. You know, there's this is a different notion of an utterance, which is the basic unit of speech, and a sentence, which is the basic unit of writing. And the point there is that they're both the word but the word isn't something simply discovered in our world. It, it is discovered, but it's also discovered in how we're creating and shaping it. And, you know, one of the illustrations, it's about, I don't know, I'm not sure how many minutes into his video, uh, but The Laughing Out has this discussion of absolute truth, and the paragraph that's listed in there, I wonder how many of those words, if they would take, if you would take those words to be wholly discovered in their meaning rather than wholly agreed upon and invented, they would be what he would call snarks. Now, e even look at the technique or the strategy, laughing out, that you used or people who watch that video, look at the technique of employing the word snarg. There, what you'd used is a, an intersection of discourse and speech to create language which you knew would be recognized as nonsense. So there's you in an intelligible video making an argument and then you introduce by way of an organismal gesticulation a noise that you within this context under this genre is going to be taken to be a word but you know that it's not a word and yet or at least you're going to claim it's a word that hasn't yet been defined and we can recognize it as undefined and it might be nonsense. But that's a strategy that was able to be employed and you meaningfully created that word because of the possibilities of meaning that were already in discourse and in the speech. At any rate, it was a great video. I hope that wasn't too technical, but I think there's a lot there. I think the, the, the real sum of it up for me is that discourse makes meaninglessness in some way impossible. That is, if some person says life is meaningless, that itself is its own meaning. That is, we live in such a condition of meaning that meaninglessness is the deficit state of the sort of overall backdrop. And that's how we can recognize nonsense. When we recognize nonsense, it's the sensical part of us that goes, oh, look, I can see that that's nonsense. Okay, thanks.